Thank you, Miss Erica. I appreciate her doing that. She didn't know she was going to sing until just about 10 minutes ago. And, uh, you know, we spring stuff on her and Brother Aaron every once in a while, and, and they try to respond as best they can. Sometimes they respond to me in other ways. <clears throat> oh, they do a good job. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you being here tonight. I really do. I, I, I'll tell you this. When I come to church, listen to this. When I come to church, and knowing what kind of preacher I am and what kind of sorry rascal I am, and I come to church and stand in the pulpit and you come to hear me, I'm thankful that anybody comes. <laughs> I'm thankful that anybody would come. Sometimes I haven't felt like coming to hear me preach. <laughs> You're supposed to laugh right there. <clears throat> I'm not sure if I had to hear me preach all the time if I would come, but I'm glad you're here. I want to, want to begin the series of messages tonight, and we'll give this one a title. <laughs> Boy, is this exciting. <clears throat> the reason for a church constitution. Isn't that thrilling to your soul? <laughs> The reason for a church constitution. We're going to look at three scriptures to begin with. Proverbs 3, 6. And then Ecclesiastes 10, 10. If you can put your finger in those two places. And then if you've got a third finger you can spare, you can put it at Titus 1, 5. Proverbs 3, 6. Ecclesiastes 10, 10. And Titus 1, 5. Who's got Proverbs 3, 6 memorized? Anybody? Quote it. In all, let's say that together, shall we? In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. One more time. Now let this soak down into your heart because it's the Bible and it's true and it works. In all thy ways, you with me? Together. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Now why is that important when we're talking about a church constitution? Because the constitution is our way of acknowledging God and letting Him direct us as a church. Now, Ecclesiastes 10.10. 10. If the iron be blunt. Now, the iron that it's talking about is an axe that you chop down a tree with. If the iron be blunt or dull, and he do not whet the edge, to whet an edge of a knife or an axe or a hoe or any cutting instrument is to sharpen it. So if the iron be blunt and he do not whet the edge, then must he put to more strength. So what does that say? You take a dull axe and you're going to beat around on a tree and just kind of bruise it up and not ever get it cut down. Abraham Lincoln said, if I had six hours to cut down a tree, I'd spend the first four sharpening the axe. I believe that's a good saying. What is that, how does that reflect upon a church constitution? Because instead of just going off helter-skelter and trying to do the work of God, a constitution sharpens our axe and makes us work more efficiently. It helps us to get the chopping done without as much effort and will be more successful. Third scripture, Titus 1.5. Titus 1.5. Paul writes to this young preacher, and he says in Titus 1.5, For this cause... Left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order, underline those words, if you will, set in order the things that are wanting, or the things that have been left undone, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now these three verses give us a starting point to speak about having a church constitution that will make us more efficient, more successful, more pleasing to God as a church trying to do the work of God. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would bless us as we come before you to look into the Word of God and to see what our, see what our instructions, our directions are. And I pray the Holy Spirit of God would get involved and Lord help us to see clearly and let these truths anchor down deep in our hearts that we might be the church that would be pleasing as it can be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, Brother, Ster Brother Aaron made a, an appalling statement yesterday to me. Brother Aaron said this. He said, Dad, 
I'm wondering if this series of messages on the Constitution might end up being a little dull. Can you imagine him saying that? I want to answer that. Are these messages on the Constitution going to be dull? Well, heavens no. I intend to put on a costume and dress up like Patrick Henry and mount a horse and ride around the auditorium shouting at the top of my lungs and preaching by lantern light. So that ought to add some interest to it, shouldn't it? <laughs> oh, our, mess our messages won't be <coughs> trudging through Robert's rules of order and trying to figure out, you know, the best way to go about uh, seconding motions and stuff like that. We may touch on a little of that, but basically we're going to be looking through the Word of God to find out how our church, look here, how our church conducts its business. And when I'm talking about business, I'm not talking about just our finances, but the whole plethora of things that we do as a church. Uh, the work of God, if you will. And now seriously, the Bible, our, our messages are going to be centered in the Bible. These are going to be Bible messages. And uh, we're going to depend on the Holy Spirit illuminating our minds as we go through it. And if He illuminates my mind and He illuminates your mind and He uses the Word of God to direct us, I think we'll end up at a good place. What do you think? Yeah. So our excursion into the church constitution is for this purpose, to keep our members and especially our newer members informed about what the church is supposed to do and why we believe what we believe. We went to a house yesterday up in Izzard County. We took, took a day off, been kind of busy and hectic here lately and a little bit stressful in some areas. So we decided to go up to Izzard County. Hadn't been up there much since my mother passed away and my brother and sister still live up there. So uh, we went up to spend some time with them and some of the relatives. And, and my brother wanted us to go out and look at a house out in the country. I mean, way out in the country. <laughs> Uh, I'm talking about over the gravel road out in the back side of the hayfield country. And so we drove over there and looked at this house. He had bought this property, and uh, <coughs> I think, <coughs> I'm not sure how, the, how it all worked out, but I, I guess he sold it to his daughter and her husband and, uh, and their family. And they're going to remodel this old house and already done some work on it, and they're going to live out there on that farm. Now, the unique thing about this old house was that it goes back. I knew about that old house. It was built way before I was born. And as we went in that old house, I stood in one of the bedrooms where I slept for three or four months, 55 years ago. And in that bedroom, besides being a bed, over in the corner was my cousin Mike's ham radio. I was simply amazed back in those days <laughs> that somebody could have a ham radio. Now, he didn't have a microphone with it. It was all done by Morse code, you know, dot, dot, dash, dot, 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 and all of that stuff. And, uh, but he could communicate with people instantly on the other side of the world. And I, I looked at that with amazement and thought, how could this be that you could talk to somebody on the other side of the world just by flipping the switch on that dot, dot, dash, dash thing. And I thought technology is surely at the height of its zenith. Now that house is undergoing some renovations right now. And uh, when I lived there, I lived with my aunt and uncle. My parents had moved up to Chicago uh, to work and to pay off some uh, debts. It had a new well drilled on our farm. And so we'd moved up there and it was time for school to start. I had gone to school there uh, previously in Chicago and let me tell you something even back then in 61 and 62 that was not the place for a country boy to live <laughs> and uh, if I'd have stayed around there much longer I would have either been killed or ended up in prison and so I wanted to go home anyway and so they let me go live with my aunt Lita and Uncle Orge O'Neill at Sage Arkansas and we lived in that old house we had an outhouse didn't have an indoor bathroom we had an outhouse and uh, most of the folks that I knew back then did. That may sound gross to you, but to us it was normal. Now, they're updating this house. They're painting the walls, and, they're, and it's going to have a new bathroom in it, and, uh, and they're renovating the place. 
And I suppose instead of having a ham radio over in the corner of the bedroom, I suspect knowing these folks, uh, he's a lawyer and, and she's, uh, uh, she's in military and, and, uh, and journalism. And so I suspect they'll have Wi-Fi and internet where the ham radio used to be. It took some updating. Now that house was fine for people 55, 75 years ago, but it needs a little updating now. And so what we're doing with our church constitution is we're getting back at the Word of God and we're going to look things up and we're going to look at what we've got and ask ourselves, does our constitution say what it needs to say in order for us to minister to and be effective for the Lord in this generation in which we live now? Now, our goal in bringing these messages will be to educate our membership as to what we believe as a church. And as we go through and look at the things, we're not changing our beliefs, but we're changing the method in which we uh, minister to people in some areas and some statements that we need to make in our Constitution. There are times when documents need to be updated, right? <laughs> and... Uh, well, get, let me give you for instance. Here, here's, here's, some, uh, here's some examples of uh, things that were written that might need to be updated. Here's a, a sign on the wall of a Baltimore estate. Quote, Trespassers will be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Signed, Sisters of Mercy. On a New York convalescent home, a nursing home in New York, here's a sign. For the sick and tired of the Episcopal Church. You're sick and tired of your church? Go to the nursing home. Uh, in a clothing store. Here's a sign in the clothing store. Wonderful bargains for men with 16 and 17 necks. Be kind of funny looking fellow, wasn't he? <laughs> here's, a, here's a sign in Tacoma, Washington. Men's clothing store. 15 men's wool suits. $100. They won't last an hour. Yeah. Maybe not worth a hundred, huh? In a New York restaurant, customers who find our waitresses rude ought to see the manager. He's really rude. <laughs> In a Budapest Zoo, sign says, Please do not feed the animals. If you have any suitable food, give it to the guard on duty. He's really hungry. <laughs> I thought these were real funny. You know, I laughed out loud when I read that one. Spotted in a safari park, elephants, please stay in your car. Everybody else can get out, but not the elephants. Outside of a photographer's studio, sign says, out to lunch. If not back by five, out to dinner also. Notice in a health food shop window, closed due to illness. On a plumber's truck, we repair what your husband fixed. <laughs> On a maternity room door, push, push, push. <laughs> At an optometrist's office, if you don't see what you're looking for, you've come to the right place. On a fence, salesman welcome. Dog food is expensive. Seen on a garbage truck, satisfaction guaranteed or double your trash back. On a church door, this is the gate of heaven. Enter in all ye by this door. In parentheses it says, this door is kept locked because of the drought. Please use a side door. Sign warning about quicksand. Quote, quicksand, any person passing this point will be drowned by order of the district council. <laughs> you walk out there, we'll drown you. <laughs> In an office. Quote, after tea breaks, staff should empty the teapot and stand upside down on the, on the draining board. <laughs> People look funny doing that one. Well, there's times anyway. <laughs> I thought they were funny. I think there are times when things that are written probably need to be updated. Our Constitution probably has a few places where we need to change some things uh, to address the culture in which we live. So let me ask you a question. Why does a church, look, why does a church even need a constitution? Some people say, well, they say it piously. Our church doesn't have a constitution. We just believe and go in by this. Well, we do too. But the only problem is if you end up in a court of law trying to defend yourself and you hand this to the judge, he's probably not going to read it all to see what you believe. I mean, I don't know about your Bible, but mine's got several hundred pages in it. And the Constitution condenses everything down. 
about what we believe about the Bible. A church that has no vision and no plan, listen, a church that has no vision and no plan to carry out the work of God will likely not accomplish what it could have accomplished with a directory like a constitution. Let me give you an illustration. I stopped in Bowling Green, Kentucky one time and went through the Corvette Museum. Everybody ought to go to the Corvette Museum. I had a Corvette one time and my wife, uh, my wife drove it through a patio door and then I shot it with a 30-30 rifle just to make sure it was dead. Uh, seriously, those things happened. <laughs> uh, you remember that, Alara? Can you remember that or just remember us telling about it? Uh, she was too little then. But uh, yeah, yeah, your mom drove it through the patio door and every time she tells it, every time Karen tells it, she laughs and that's why I'm telling it first so she doesn't get to laugh. She's laughing anyway. Well anyway, I can take you to the Corvette Museum and, and, and you could walk around that huge museum and you could look at every model of Corvette that has been manufactured from 1954 until today's date. You could see them. You could admire their beauty and I don't think there's anybody, even if you don't care for sports cars, I doubt that there's anybody in here who could not uh, look at those beautiful Corvettes and say, man, that took some planning and some precision to build those beauties. Well, that's what I think. Now we could, go, we could also go to the manufacturing plant, which is also there, and watch the assembly line where they make the Corvettes. And as the assembly line begins and they put some parts on that assembly line and as it moves down and they add more parts and add more parts and eventually it gets to the end of the assembly line and off rolls a brand new beautiful Corvette ready to be driven away. A beauty. On the other hand, we could go up to the salvage yard where there's parts of cars laying everywhere. And I could take all of you up there and, and I could get on a bulldozer and push a bunch of those parts up in a big heap in a big pile and say, there, there's my beautiful car. Do you agree that that's as beautiful as the Corvette? <laughs> I don't think you'd want to buy that one, would you? You know what happens when a church does not have a set of marching orders, regulations, directions, instructions for its operation it's kind of like going to the salvage yard and just pushing a bunch of stuff up together and saying this is the best we can do. We need to turn out the Corvettes put together by precision. Look at 1 Corinthians 14.40. 1 Corinthians 14.40. Some of you may have that one memorized. 1 Corinthians 14.40 says simply, let all things be done decently and what? In order. Let all things be done. Paul is writing to the church at Corinth. He's saying to the church at Corinth, and that church at Corinth, look, that church at Corinth was a splintered, selfish, uh, wild, un unbiblical type of church. They were saved, but they didn't know anything, and just about everything they're doing is wrong. And Paul says, hey, church, let everything be done decently and in order. How do you do that? Well, one of the ways you do that is to have a church constitution that shows you what you're going to do. Now, everything I'm talking about tonight is a general introduction to what we're going to do in the next few weeks. Uh, let me give you an illustration of why things like a church constitution make a difference. You might go for years and say, I didn't even know we had a church constitution. I didn't know we even needed one. In fact, I've been in churches that didn't have a constitution. <laughs> or if they did, they didn't let anybody know about it. But here's when you find out you need a church constitution. Let's say the church suddenly has to make a huge decision. This happens in church. I know, where, I, I know of a church where this happened. I know several churches where this happened. Where uh, Somebody in church got mad at the pastor and said, and they went around and talked to some of the other members and got some people stirred up. You know that happens, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people can go around and talk and get stuff stirred up. And I know of a particular church I'm thinking of right now. Some people got stirred up and wanted to get rid of the pastor, but there wasn't enough people in the church to get rid of him. So you know what they did? 
they went out and drove through the hills and hollers until they found enough old moss-backed Christians who used to go to that church and their name was still on the church roll. And they went out and talked to... Those people hadn't been to church in 10 years. And they gathered them all up and because they were still on a voting membership roll, they got a whole crowd together and outvoted the people who had been diligently serving the Lord in that place week after week after week. And the crowd out there, that they just only thing they had in common is they hated the same person. <laughs> and so they came in and voted the pastor out. No, it wasn't me. <laughs> it's the only church I've ever pastored. And don't think about doing that either. <laughs> so that helps you to know if a church constitution clears its roles every once in a while, people that just kind of drift away and don't come back, uh, it's in our church constitution that, that they eventually get dropped from the roll if they don't show up for church. Because after all, why should the people who diligently come every Sunday suddenly have a bunch of folks out there who didn't care for anything about the church flock in all of a sudden and impose their will upon the faithful people who've been going there all along? That wouldn't make sense, would it? So that's, how, that's one of the reasons for a church constitution. Well, let's look at some things. Uh, oh, man. Hey, Brother Denny, could you go in, there, in the copier? I meant to have you hand those out. We got a copy of the first page of the Constitution. And get somebody to help him, and we'll hand those things out. Let everybody have page one of the Constitution. When we get through, when we get finished with this, uh, you'll have every page of the Constitution and the places where we're going to make changes. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll discuss those eventually in a meeting, not, not on every Wednesday night. But we'll make changes in it, propose changes in it, and then we'll present them in writing September the 4th, and we'll adopt the, the changes to the Constitution, uh, the amendments, and so forth. So every, there's enough for everybody. I think there's enough for everybody to have one. I made 30 or 32, something like that. So maybe... There's enough for all of you to have one. So the first thing on our the, the first thing on the church constitution is uh, the name of the church. We address the name of the church. <laughs> Somebody asked me when when we first planted Liberty Baptist Church 19 years ago. Somebody asked before they joined the church. Listen. You think the name of the church is not important? Somebody asked me before they joined this church, they said, why did, uh, why did the church get named Liberty anyway? Now they had a reason for asking that. I think they might have been thinking maybe the thought was Liberal Baptist Church. <laughs> and that was certainly not the idea. But the name of the church is important. I think names help to identify things. Don't you agree? Names help to identify things. Uh, what's on the outside should give you an idea of what's on the inside. Did you hear that? What's on the outside should be an indication of what's on the inside. And that's not just true of churches, that's true of individual Christians. What's on the outside should say something about what's on the inside. You say, but God's not interested in the outside. It never, the Bible never said that. The Bible says God looketh upon the heart, and man looks on the outward appearance, but that was said in the context of God choosing David as the next king of Israel, and, and David was just a, compared to King Saul, he was kind of a scrawny punk, not very big, and not very uh, physically mature, but he had a heart. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart, and Saul was not. What was Saul? The Bible says Saul was tall. He was very tall. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. And everybody said, King Saul, man, he'll make a good king. He's big. <laughs> but how did he turn out? He turned out to be a sorry rascal. David was a man after God's own heart. So that's the context in which it talks about the inside as opposed to the outside. It's not, Jesus said, let the, out, let the inside of the cup and platter be washed, that the outside might be clean also. And so you and I are a reflection of Jesus Christ. It tells people what's inside the wrapper. Uh, can you imagine going to the grocery store? 
and you walk down the aisle where all those cans are, and they're all just silver cans, no labels. <laughs> and you pick one up and you say, man, I wonder if that's sweet peas or beets. <laughs> I wonder if that's corn or green beans. And you ask the store clerk, why, why is there not labels on the cans? He said, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's on the inside. <laughs> How many of you just love those purple beets? You love beets? That's what I thought. A few of us do, two or three of us. How many of you love green, those English peas? Huh? A few more like those. Uh, new potatoes. Yeah. Uh, black, black eyed peas. Purple hull peas. Everybody loves purple hull peas. <laughs> uh, if you went to the grocery store, wouldn't you like it if they put labels on the can so you, before you buy the can, you know what's in it? Hello? Um, the same thing is true of a church. The church, the name Baptist, and Brother Paul went through this in a not long ago, and, and I kind of finished it up the last couple of lessons, went through talking about the characteristics of Baptist. I kind of like it that, that you can go to a Baptist church and you kind of know what to expect. Doesn't mean we're all monolithic. We're not all the same, but we're, we're similar. And, and if you go to a Baptist church, most of the time, I mean, you can run into anything, right? But most of the time you go to a Baptist church, you're going to figure they believe in salvation by grace and you ought to get baptized after you're saved. And when they talk about baptism in a Baptist church, you figure they're probably going to have a pool of water there or they're going to go out to the river and duck you under the water, right? When you get baptized, say amen. <laughs> and if you went to a Methodist church, would you expect if you went to the Methodist church that if they said they were going to baptize you, what do you think they're going to do? Huh? They're going to sprinkle a little water. And you don't have to be saved. You just got to be born. I mean, they sprinkle babies, right? And so that kind of gives you an idea of what's on the inside of the church. We're a Baptist church. But let's go to the name Liberty. We're talking about Liberty Baptist Church. Uh, the name Liberty was chosen for several reasons. Uh, we'll give at least three of them. Think about this. Now, that, remember, that man asked me, why did Liberty get the name Liberty? Well, Liberty gives the idea of being freed from bondage. Are you with me? Liberty gives the idea of being freed from bondage. You say, well, who's in bondage today? Can I tell you number one? People are born in bondage to Satan. People are born lost. People are born following the devil. You don't have to teach a child to sin. It comes normal, natural. Uh, to the people who might be watching on the internet tonight, can I just tell you that everyone who has not trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, you belong to the devil. You're his property. You say, I'm offended. Oh, don't be offended. I'm just trying to tell you the truth. If you're not saved, you belong to Satan. Let me read just a few verses to you. You can mark them down if you want to on your paper there. Colossians 1.13. Listen to this. This is speaking of someone who got saved. It says of Jesus, who hath delivered us. The, the key word there is what? Delivered. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Why, do. why do lost people enjoy sin? Because that's what lost people do. Isaiah 61, verse 1. This is speaking of the Lord Jesus in the Old Testament. Isaiah 61, 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek, he hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim, listen to this, liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. <coughs> so what are we saying? We're saying 
the name liberty. One of the reasons our church is called liberty is because we understand from the scriptures, from the Bible itself, that people are born in bondage to the devil. That's why it comes easy to sin. I'm not saying that saved people don't sin. I'm just saying that it's easy for lost people to sin and they are in bondage to that sin and always will be, whether it's little sin or big sin, it doesn't matter. The Bible teaches that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And as long as someone has rejected Christ as Savior, they're in bondage to Satan and always will be until Jesus sets them free. And Jesus said that the Father has sent him to proclaim liberty to the captives. You know why Liberty Baptist Church came to Searcy, Arkansas? I believe Liberty Baptist Church existed in the mind of God eons ago. And God wanted a church in Liberty and Searcy to proclaim liberty to the captives. The people that's been led to the Lord recently, they've been freed from Satan's power. They've been delivered. They have liberty now to live as God would have them to live. And so liberty means being set free from the bondage of Satan. Number two, set, forth, set free from sin as its slave. We are slaves to sin, not just to Satan, but to sin. Romans 8, 21 says, Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty, there's the word, under the glorious liberty of the children of God. Some might say, well, preacher, I'm not a Christian and I'm, I'm not a slave to sin. Oh, I beg to differ with you because the Bible teaches otherwise. Before I got saved, I was a slave to sin. Everybody sins differently. But before people are saved, they cannot turn loose of their sin. Oh, they might quit a habit here, habit there, but it takes the power of God to break the bondage from sin. I'll tell you how. I was, uh, let me just give you an example, okay? I, I preached to the, uh, to the Zuni Indians a couple of weeks ago, and I wanted those guys in jail uh, to know that I wasn't born a Christian. I wasn't always a goody two-shoes. I wasn't always a holy Joe. I was just as bad as everybody else, and I went to jail just like they did. You say, preacher, you mean you've been in jail? Yeah, you didn't know that, did you? <laughs> yeah. Been in jail. Awful, isn't it? Been in bondage. as before I'm saved. <laughs> now, I'm not saying I won't ever be in jail again. Time may come when preachers get arrested. Who knows? But I used to be in bondage to sin. When there was a family reunion, look here, when there was a family reunion and I was invited to go to the family reunion, I would start to think about it and actually kind of start to make plans to go to it. And then the slavery came to the forefront of my mind. You know what came to my mind? I thought, now at that reunion, those are a bunch of religious folks and they won't have booze. I would rather be somewhere where they're drinking. And, and, and if I go there, those folks are going to be talking about the Bible and Jesus and stuff like that. And, and that's just not me. I want to be around my friends that know how to cuss real good and know how to be immoral and do all these other things. I want to be with them. Hey, I felt that way. I mean, I was nervous in church. I was nervous as a long-tailed tomcat in a room full of rocking chairs. I mean, I didn't feel like I belonged there. And I didn't want to go. When I thought it over for a little while, I thought, I'm not going to that reunion. That's not... That's not me. That's not where I belong. Somebody invite me to go to church and I say, I don't want to go there. That's not me. That's not my people. Then after I got saved, the Lord set me free from that sin. I went home the day I got saved and spent all afternoon pouring booze down the bathtub. All the billions of bacteria in my septic tank were drunk for months. And all the deacons in our church was mad because I poured it out. They wanted it. I was, uh, I was in bondage. You know, you know how much in bondage I was? I had, an old, I had an old store building, and I had booze under the counter, and so I was within a few steps, and I could have, uh, I could have a good swig of booze right there. Or if I was in my delivery truck, I had a big old flatbed 
a Chevy truck. I could, if I got in that thing, uh, I, I didn't want to get too far from my booze because you see there was a chain hooked to me. It was a chain of sin. And when I got in that truck, if I got down the road a mile or two and felt like I wanted a drink, I could reach under the seat. Under the seat and I had booze. I had a four on the floor and a fifth under the seat. <laughs> if I got home and wanted to go upstairs, I had wine I was making up there. My chain was... My chain was short. I couldn't get very far away from my sin, so I had my sin stationed at every point, so I had it nearby. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Sin has a chain on it, and we are enslaved by our sins, and only Jesus can set us free. When he set me free, I poured it all out. I said, I don't need that anymore. And Jesus cut the chain, chopped it in two. Now I can go anywhere I want to, and I don't have to worry about whether I can buy liquor there or not. I can go to a family reunion. I can go to church. I can go any place I want to go, and there doesn't have to be drugs. doesn't have to be immorality. doesn't have to be booze. I can go there and enjoy myself and be content because I've been set free. My sweet friend, if you're not saved, and you've heard the gospel of how Jesus died to save you from your sins, and you haven't accepted him yet, there's a reason why you hadn't, and it's because you're a slave to your sin. You say, I don't care what you say, I'm not a slave. I used to say that too. Somebody could say, you know, I'm, you drink every day. Are you, are you an alcoholic? No, I'm not an alcoholic. And don't say that again. You know, I had a short chain. and God chopped it in two. Now I've been given what? I've been given liberty. <laughs> I can go as, and live as Christ wants me to live and I can be the real me, not the one that the devil wanted. Amen. <laughs> liberty, the name liberty was chosen to represent a release from Satan, a release from sin, and number three, release from salvation by dead works. When we came to Searcy, Arkansas to plant this church, yes, we had a constitution and we uh, came up with the name Liberty and, uh, and it was not just being released from Satan and released from sin, but people in this area need to be released from a religion of dead works. Searcy is a city overflowing with religion, but it's a religion of dead works. When I say dead works, what I'm talking about, dead works enslaves a people. Dead works is when people think they've got to do this thing and they've got to do that thing and, and you've got to do all these good deeds in order to obtain your salvation. And then once you get it, you hadn't really got it. You've got to keep doing more stuff or you may lose what you thought you had. Because they say they believe in grace, but they put a price tag on it and tell you that you can't keep it without paying the installment plan on it. Can I just tell you that I believe that people ought to get baptized after they get saved, but it won't save you. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but by his mercy hath he saved us. And just going to church, I think everybody ought to go to church. And I think the pews ought to be full tonight. And I wish every Bible preaching church in America was just overflowing. I think people ought to go to church. But you know, going to church won't save you. And it won't keep you saved. You're saved. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. Through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. He didn't say anything about making installment payments on your salvation for by grace are you saved through f faith and not of yourselves it is a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast I've talked to numerous people in this city and they I would ask them this question just to get right down to the bottom line I would ask them this question do you believe somebody can go to heaven without being baptized if they just believe on Christ as Savior and they're sincere in their heart they believe on Christ as Savior. Can they go to heaven without being baptized? And they say, well, no. You've got to be baptized. And you've got to hold out faithful. And, and you've got to do this, that, and the other thing. Listen, when they start saying there's more to it than just believing, you can rest assured they've got a dead works salvation. Look, there's two, two, kinds, of, there's two kinds of religion in the world. One says do... 
and you'll be saved. The other says, it's done. Believe and you'll be saved. Jesus did it all on the cross of Calvary. And friend, when you try to add something to it, it's like a slap in the face to our Savior who bled and died. Hey, if we couldn't get saved by, by works in the first place, why would we even need a Savior to begin with? We just work it out ourselves. And you can't. It's a religion of death. Galatians 5 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. He's saying, Look, when you get saved, you don't have to be hooked to a chain of dead works trying to stay saved. When you believe on Christ as your Savior, it's a done deal. You can't do anything to improve it, you can't do anything to keep it. He saved you by grace, He'll keep you by grace. Well, <clears throat> the purpose of the church, what is it? See that on your uh, handout there you got, the purpose of the church? <clears throat> you can read that section a little bit later, but let me just tell you <clears throat> that, there, that the church needs a purpose. It's better to aim at something and not hit it perfectly than to aim at nothing and hit that. It's better to aim at it and hit something than to aim at nothing and hit that. What's our conclusion? Well, as purpose to our church, anything that we do for God's glory is part of our purpose. 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, whether, it be, whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Listen, friend, look here. Y'all are watching by way of internet. Anything that you do, can you honestly say, this will bring glory and honor to Jesus Christ? If you can't, if it would dishonor him, it's not good. If a church does things that dishonors Christ, it's not good. It ought not to be part of our purpose. If it brings glory to Christ, then that's good. So anytime you do things that's in disobedience to the word of God, you can just rest assured that it does not bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's our, what's our mission toward the world around us? Look, our, our personal mission is to worship the Lord and love Him with all of our heart, but our mission to the world is the Great Commission, going out and winning people to Jesus Christ and discipling them. That's what our church has been doing, and that's what we're going to do and keep on doing. And if anything, we just want to increase it and do it more and more and more. Why do we want to do that? So we can get more names on the church roll? No, we want to win them to Jesus Christ to keep them out of hell and have a place in heaven instead. Now, friend, maybe some of you out there watching on the Internet, I want to ask you this. Do you have a constitution in your life? Our church needs a constitution by which to operate. What do you operate by? We Christians have one. We operate by this. If your life is unfulfilled and empty and disappointing, you're probably not using the Word of God directed by the Spirit of God as your constitution. When you make that your directive in life, you'll be fulfilled and you won't have to go outside God's will to find anything to bring you joy and fulfillment. You'll find it all right there. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, I pray that you'd bless us as we come to the invitation time. I pray you'd help our hearts to be tender and Lord, I pray that if there's people in this room or those watching by the internet or listening on a later recorded sermon, I pray that if they don't know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that you'd let them understand the will of God tonight is for them to be saved. Let them know how much you love them, Lord. Oh, how much you love them. Let them know. And Lord, I pray that they'd be willing right this moment to surrender their hearts and lives to you. And I pray that those who are Christians and have not been living according to the Constitution, the Bible, I pray that they'd surrender to you tonight. For those who are unsaved, I pray that they'd pray something like this. Dear Lord, I'm a sinner, and I know it. I know the Bible says I'm a sinner. I understand I'm a sinner. But I don't want to go to hell, Lord. And I pray you'd save my soul tonight. I surrender my life to you. I believe you are the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross to pay for my sins. I believe you rose again from the grave, and I believe you're alive today. I believe you're real, and I believe you're speaking to my heart right now. And I'm asking you to save me this moment. 
and release me from my sins, the sin debt. Save me for tonight and forever. If you prayed that, dear friend, I, I want to tell you that God is faithful to keep his word. And Lord, as we finish our prayer, I pray that the invitation would be open to all those who have open hearts. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand as the piano plays? And if you have need to come to the altar tonight for any reason, whatever your reason, 